The Lenten season begins on Ash Wednesday with the imposition of ashes onto our forehead. It is a sober reminder of our mortality that we really are dust, and to the dust we shall return. We will use the 40 days of the Lenten season to journey with Jesus through his final days. Our theme here at our church is, What Wondrous Love Is This? I hope you can join us. Good morning and welcome to Weatherly. Whether you are in person or online, we are happy you're with us today. Welcome to Weatherly, where we are boldly inclusive, faithfully thinking, and progressively Baptist. My name is Melissa Llewellyn, and I am the deacon on call this week. So if you have need, do not hesitate to call the church or me. If you, if you need me. I will be in the narthex behind the sanctuary at the end of the service if you have any questions. Again, welcome. If you are willing and able, would you please stand and pass the peace of Christ to one another? And if you're joining us online, it is so good to have you in this space. Peace of Christ to you. If you have questions about our service, or if you have questions about upcoming events, or if you have prayer requests, we would love to chat with you. You can give us a call or send us an email.
In the next few days, we prepare for the season of Lent. This Tuesday is Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras or Shrove Tuesday. We will have a pancake supper in the lighthouse at 6 p.m. And we hope you will join us for dinner. And we hope you'll join us on Wednesday for our Ash Wednesday service. Following pancake supper, if you come, everything will be set up to begin packing for spring break backpacks. If you would like to stay and pack a few bags, that would be greatly appreciated. And if you have a student who has completed sixth grade through completed senior in high school, I hope that you will sign them up for summer camp. We are headed to Unidiversity in Merville, Tennessee, and I am thrilled. For now, let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Please join me in our litany. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Like Peter, James, and John, we have seen your majesty, Lord. In our imaginations, we have seen your dazzling clothes and the prophets Elijah and Moses. We have seen the overshadowing cloud and heard the voice from heaven. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And we listen, Lord. We listen for words of hope and grace, which we gladly share with the world around us. We listen for words of commission, sending us into the world to be agents of your healing. Transfigure us so that we might make the world a better place for your human family. So it be. Let us pray. Alpha and Omega, from the beginning, you created with love. Today we ponder the words you spoke over the living Christ. This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. May we tune our hearts and ears to listen to him, to respond as he would. May we too know just how beloved you see all of us. May we too one day sense how pleased you are with us. For today, forgive us of the ways we have not acted according to your laws of justice and righteousness and bestow your grace and mercy upon us. We desire to honor you with all that we are in your magnificent creation. Amen. Our scripture readings for this Transfiguration Sunday begin in the book of Exodus, this wonderful story we all remember about Moses. The Lord said to Moses, come up to, to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he said, wait here for us until we come to you again. For Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And also the story of this day from Matthew's account. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. 
If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, I think about our prayer list from time to time and You know, there's a lot of need represented just among the people listed on our prayer list today. And I suspect some of you carry issues in your own life and your family that are not represented here, which makes it all the more important that we be diligent in our prayers of intercession for one another. During the time of silence, I invite you to say your personal prayers, and then I'll lead us in the pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Lord, your people gather here in this sanctuary, down the street and around the world. On this cool, sunny morning here in Huntsville, we are pleased to take our place and do our part. We gather here with simple hopes, a simple worship experience, a simple encounter with you, and simple commitments to do and be our best for you. So meet us here, Lord. We know that we need you desperately. Today, Lord, we ask that you would forgive the church's sin. While we honor our Baptist heritage here, we know that your family is large, much larger than just our Baptist family. So forgive the barriers we have erected, barriers of doctrine, heritage, practice, and style. When your son gave his life to break down the dividing walls of hostility that separate your children, Lift our vision so that from our Baptist perspective, we may join the conversation of the larger body of Christ, not dominating it, not invalidating the voices of others, but participating in this great conversation of redemption. May we work with Jesus our Lord and not against him so that the church may be one, even as you and the Father are one. And Lord, we also ask that you would forgive our personal sin. We have made wrong choices, not accidentally, purposefully, willfully, in direct disregard of what we believe. Our choices have hurt others, and they have hurt us. Show us the way back to you, to our loved ones, and to our real selves. May a festival of forgiveness be played out in our hearts, and then may we joyfully serve you and faithfully live the teachings of our faith. So come, you who dazzled on the mountain of transfiguration, come to all this worshiping body, some carrying deep pain within, personal struggles, and teach us all how to to turn loose. Teach us how to release ourselves into your loving care. O God, whose name we praise, redeem the struggling souls this morning. We ask it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.
for the many ways that you give to sustain the work of Weatherly and the kingdom of God, let us give thanks. Creator God of infinite patience, we see you in every plant that grows and blossoms, every creature that runs or flies, in mountains and sunsets, and in every drop of rain that falls. Creation is not something that happened, but something that is happening every day. As we share our tithes and offerings today, we pray you, through Jesus, will continue the work of creation in us, that we might become more tolerant, more forgiving, more generous, and more loving. In that name, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy And when I think 
of God, his Son, heart sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. Take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul. I've always believed some sermons need to be repeated. Some songs need to be repeated too, and that's one to repeat, Harris. Thank you. According to the webpage, Word at Work, the phrase mountaintop experience originated with the Bible. Careful readers of the Bible know to pay attention closely anytime the action of a text is taking place on a mountain. Noah's Ark came to rest on Mount Ararat after the flood, and it was there on the mountain that God made the covenant never to destroy the earth with water again. Solomon built a temple, a place of God's abode on Mount Moriah. Moses, in our text, went up on Mount Sinai, came down with the Ten Commandments. Remember Mount Carmel, where Elijah had this battle with the prophets of Baal, and the fire of God came down and consumed those prophets? Some of us will get to visit Mount Carmel in September. King David built his city, the city of Jerusalem, the city of God on Mount Zion. And let us not forget some of Jesus' greatest teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. So yes, the careful readers know to pay close attention anytime the action is on a mountain because that is where humans encounter the divine. 
We now use that phrase to describe our high spiritual moments, those times when it seems that we are transported, uh, transported from the, uh, the mundane and the routine of life to the realms of spiritual depth and joy. It might have been a walk to Emmaus for you. It might have been a mission trip or a Bible study group that you belong to, maybe the birth of your child. For Peter, James, and John, those three disciples who appear to be like the, the inner circle of the twelve, it was the experience they had from our text for today from Matthew chapter 17, what we now call the transfiguration of Jesus. It occurred on a mountain. We don't know which mountain because the text doesn't say, but tradition says it was Mount Tabor. You know, I've got to confess that, and I've, I've preached the Transfiguration Sunday sermons for many years now, and I've often struggled to, to make a connection of this text to our lives. I mean, it's obvious to see why it was so important to Peter, James, and John. They were there. We weren't. We did not get to, to see and hear what they saw and heard. So that's been my struggle. What does this text mean for us? Until I saw the connection between this story and what happened six days earlier. According to Matthew, six days before this mountaintop experience, Jesus and his disciples were in Caesarea Philippi. The disciples told Jesus that the townspeople there in Philippi had kind of mixed opinions about who he was. Some were saying, you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some are saying that you are the prophet Elijah or maybe one of the other prophets of the Old Testament. And Jesus, in a, just a masterful way, turned the question around to them, making it personal, as faith always is, and asked them, but who do you say that I am? And it was Peter who took the lead in response to this question of Jesus, Peter made his greatest confession and one of his greatest blunders. Peter rightly said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus praised Peter for that response. And then he went on to tell Peter and the other disciples about how he was going to have to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders and about how they were going to put him to death. And upon hearing these words about suffering and death, Peter stepped forward again, this time rebuking Jesus. God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. Now, I don't doubt that Peter meant well. But Jesus responded to Peter with these harsh words. Get behind me, Satan. Matthew then says six days after that, Peter, James, and John <clears throat> had that mountaintop experience to top all mountaintop experiences. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a high mountain, and there the text says that he was transformed before them. The Greek word is metamorphoi, from which we get the English word metamorphosis. It is in the passive voice, meaning it was not something Jesus did. It was something that was done to him. He was passive. Apparently, God the Father changed God the Son so that his face shone as bright as the sun above and his clothes dazzled white and suddenly two Old Testament figures Moses and the prophet Elijah were standing and talking with Jesus. Peter took the lead again. I love Peter. He said in essence, Lord it's a good thing I'm here. I'm going to build three dwelling places. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You know the, the thing I love about <clears throat> Peter is he was all in, man. He was a 100% disciple of Jesus Christ. This time, however, he didn't get to dwell, uh, build any dwelling places for Jesus or Moses or Elijah. While he was still making his offer to Jesus, a cloud came and overshadowed the area where they were. 
And a voice spoke from the cloud saying, this is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. And then these three words tacked on to the end. Listen to him. Now, if those words are familiar to you, you may recall that they were said at Jesus' baptism too. This is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. Except this time, it adds those last three words. Listen to him. When Peter, James, and John heard the voice from the cloud, the text says that they fell down in fear. And the next thing they knew was the touch of Jesus, inviting them to stand up and not be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone. And Matthew says they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. That must have been amazing. That must have been the mountaintop experience truly to top all mountaintop experiences. But what did it mean? And even more importantly, what does it mean for us? I see three things. First, this transfiguration experience for Peter, James, and John was another validation of who Jesus was. The first came at his baptism, and now here it comes again, but it also says something about the way of Jesus, the way by which he will accomplish his mission. Peter had it only partly right six days earlier in Caesarea Philippi. Yes, he was the Christ, the son of the living God, the Messiah, the one for whom they've been waiting all these ages. However, Peter fail to understand the way of Jesus. Jesus' way would not be political intrigue and power. It would be the way of a cross, of losing one's life in order to gain it. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased, the voice said. That's the same validation we heard earlier with these three words added. Listen to him. In other words, the Shema. Hear, O Israel. The second thing I see here has to do with Moses and Elijah. They were two of the most important figures of Israel's past. Moses, of course, was the prophet who brought the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He went up on a mountain too, and he's the one who brought down the law, the Torah. And the prophet Elijah, according to the Old Testament, you may remember, never died. Instead, he was caught up in a whirlwind. So Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets, the sources of authority for the people of Israel. But when Peter, James, and John looked up, Moses was gone. Elijah was gone. They were left with Jesus himself alone. Moses and Elijah were their past Jesus was their present and their future. He was their new source of authority. And then the last thing I see here, and this is where it applies to us. Peter, James, and John had to come down the mountain, didn't they? They had to come down the mountain. As tempting as it may have been to stay and glory in that mountaintop experience, the challenge of faith was at the foot of the mountain, in the valley, in the mundane routine affairs of life. You know, Moses didn't get to stay on Mount Sinai. He had work to do in the valley, and neither would Peter, James, and John stay on the mountain of transfiguration. There was work for them to do. And I would say that's an important word for the church today. Listen to him. Our work, our work is not up in the, in the realms of, of glory. Our work is right here with each other and in the neighborhoods where we live. The one who must stand at the center of our present and of our future is Jesus himself alone. We do not have the authority to make our church anything we want. We don't determine the way. If we dare try, the message of Jesus is harsh. Get behind me, 
Satan, he would say. Jesus has determined our way. We listen to him and follow the way that he has determined. That means that we must come down the mountain. Neither Moses nor Jesus retired on the mountaintop. The reality is that we don't live out our faith in the mountaintop realms of joy and wonder. We live out our faith in the valley, in the mundane, routine affairs of life, going to work and school every day, caring for children, working with our international community, building homes for people. Just look at the way of Jesus. If we listen to him, we will imitate his way. The chiefs seem to get this. They're back in home, uh, at home in Kansas City after their Super Bowl uh, victory last Sunday night. And talk about a mountaintop experience. That welcome home must have been phenomenal. There was a ticker tape parade. Hundreds of thousands of fans gathered to welcome them back. Some camped out overnight, you know that? Just so they'd have a good view of the team when they got there. Coach Reed carrying that famous Lombardi trophy. Patrick Mahomes, their quarterback, was carrying his most valuable player trophy. And several of the players spoke to the crowd. And I thought what they had to say was very important and telling. Mahomes said, I just want to let you all know that this is just the beginning. We ain't done yet. He knew there's work to be done. There was training. There were plays to memorize. They had to come down the mountain. And I think that's the word for us. Mountaintop experiences are good, but that's not where we live. We live in the valley below with cantankerous neighbors, pictures of hungry children, with homeless people under a bridge, an unjust war in Ukraine, with friends on our list here who are sick or going through a divorce or looking squarely at their mortality. We do not retire on the mountain. We come down the mountain to work for the healing of God's world. You see, here's the thing. As the quarterback said, we ain't done yet. Let's pray. Oh Lord, give us ears to hear, hearts to care, and wills to follow. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is, if I can find it, number 578. And as we sing this closing hymn, I extend to you the invitation of our church and of our Lord. You know, maybe you've been contemplating being baptized and you're ready to make that decision as Elijah White did recently. Uh, We would love to celebrate that decision with you. I invite you to come forward and I'll share your decision with the church. And then we'll set up a time for you to be baptized. Or maybe you're ready to join our church. You can come forward uh, during this hymn also. Or if you would prefer, you can fill out this form. Hand it to me before you leave today and I'll give you a call this next week. And we'll talk about church membership. Okay.
and our children can come forward for our children's lesson. Good morning. I have a big word to teach y'all this morning. Can you say transfiguration? Transfiguration. Very good. Now, who knows what that means? That's a big word, isn't it? Well, I have something to help you understand what transfiguration means. Meredith, can you hold this for me? What color is this liquid? Blue. Blue. All right, I'm going to pour some blue liquid into that jar that Meredith is holding. Isn't it pretty? What if I told you I could make that blue liquid even prettier? What if I told you I could change the color? Would you believe me? No? <laughs> well, let's see if I can make this work then. All right. Here goes. All right. We have to watch real close, okay? It happens pretty fast. What color is it now? Red. Is it kind of pink? How did it go from blue to pink? Because you mixed it. I mixed it up. That's right. Yeah. Transfiguration means that you take something in one form and then you turn it into an even more beautiful form. Jesus was on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and the Bible tells us that he was changed from his appearance to a sparkly, dazzling white and a light shone all around him. God said, this is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. So transfiguration means that something changes from one thing to another, like Jesus' clothes were dazzling white. And we can be transfigured too. We can change from however we are to be more loving and more kind and more like Jesus. We can go from being blue to being pink, to be more beautiful people because of Jesus. Let's pray. Holy God, we're so thankful for your love for us and for the gift of Jesus. Transfigure our hearts to be more like him, to be filled with your love, to be filled with your beauty, and to care for the beauty of creation. Amen. Today is an important day for this church. You are electing a pastor search committee that a number of months down the road is going to recommend a new pastor to this church. The ones who are on your ballot have agreed to serve on that committee if they are elected. If you've already turned in your ballot, thank you. If you've not, you can give it to me, Madison Harris or Usher, uh, or you're welcome to call in your vote or email it during this next week. The cutoff for voting is Friday, so be sure to do it by then. As you are able, please stand to receive the benediction. And now may the love and grace of God, our heavenly parent, the challenge of Jesus Christ, our brother, and the ever-presence of God's Spirit go with you this day, this week, until we meet again. Amen.